Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this 13th meeting in 2020 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Our first item today um, is John Scott, MSP, joining the committee to declare any relevant interest. Mr Scott, may I ask you if you have any relevant interest to the committee? I have no relevant interest to declare, uh, Mr Kidd. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for uh, for coming along and being part of the committee. I, I know that you have experience of um, of dealing with important parliamentary issues. Um, and John comes on to the committee to replace Alexander Stewart, MSP, of course. And I'd like to put on record my thanks and the committee's thanks to Alexander for his work with us. Um, he contributed well. I wasn't with us for long, but. Um, he made a, a good contribution, and thanks very much to Alexander Stewart, MSP. Uh, welcoming John to the committee, and um, our next item today then is for the committee to decide whether its consideration of code of conduct rule changes, standing order rule changes, and our future work programme should be taken in private at future meetings. Do members agree to take these items in private? There's no one. Uh, there's no one at all registered any any other direction. So we will take that as read. Um, we'll now move on to subordinate legislation, agenda item three, and that's for the committee to take evidence on the Scottish Parliament disqualification order 2020 draft and on the representation of the people electoral registers publication date coronavirus Scotland regulations 2020 draft. Joining us today uh, to discuss these issues are Graham Day, Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans. Welcome, Mr. Day, and Jamie Bowman, Al Gibson, and Kenneth Pentland as his officials. And I would now like to invite the minister to make a short opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Day. Uh, good morning, convener, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the committee for the invitation to appear before it today to give evidence on the draft Scottish Parliament Disqualification Order 2020. The order is an established item of business in advance of each Scottish Parliament election. The draft order before the committee today is the sixth such order, but it's the first since the Scotland Act 2016 devolved full competence over disqualification to the Scottish Parliament. Section 15 of the Scotland Act 1998 sets out the circumstances in which a person is disqualified automatically from membership of the Parliament, for example, by virtue of being a judge, a civil servant, or member of the armed forces. In addition, Section 15 provides an order-making power to disqualify specific office holders from membership of the Parliament, allowing for separation between the legislator and the holders of various public offices. This serves to help reinforce their independence from one another. We consulted widely with policy officials and sponsor teams within the Scottish Government and with Parliament officials on the entries pertaining to the Scottish Parliament's corporate body. And with the help of officials in the Secretary of State for Scotland's office, we gathered responses from the UK Government, Welsh Government and the Northern Ireland Executive, because offices throughout the UK are relevant to this. The draft order updates the list of disqualified offices to reflect relevant appointments which have been abolished, renamed or created since making, order, making uh, the 2015 order. A total of 61 new disqualifications have been added, 19 have been removed and nine minor amendments have been made uh, to existing disqualified offices. All told, convener, there are 537 posts uh, on the list that we are considering today. To give you an example, um, we have added non-executive members of Scottish Forestry and Forestry and Land Scotland to the order, uh, as such agencies were established on the 1st of April 2019, and ministers are responsible for determining the overall policy and resource framework within which these agencies operate. Non-executive members of these agencies are not civil servants and would not otherwise have been disqualified. The list is, as I've said, extensive given the breadth of the public body landscape across the UK. But members should not see the order as a constraint on the wide talent available to this Parliament, as those in a disqualified office 
can of course opt to step down from such positions and seek to bring their breadth of experience uh, to the Scottish Parliament. I wrote to the presiding officer, the chairman of the Electoral Commission and to representatives of the main political parties to draw their attention to the government's laying of the draft order and in particular to its effect and scope. I think, Convener, um, that's probably enough for me and I should uh, happily take questions now from members. No, um, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you for that outline. Um, so, would any committee members uh, have anything that they'd like to contribute uh, to this? I don't see anything at the moment. Um, right. Oh, no. Um, Mark Rusko, please. Mark Rusko. Yeah, um, morning, everybody. Um, I suppose the, the, the big context to all of these orders that, are, that we're discussing this morning uh, is the COVID crisis. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Minister, about what kind of assessment has been done uh, on the potential impact of the COVID crisis to next year's Holyrood elections. Um, I'm particularly interested how this might affect the conduct of the elections and perhaps some of the pressures that places onto EROs as well. It's, it's a very good question, uh, Mr. Mr. Ruskell. You're probably aware, and members are possibly aware, that the government is currently consulting with the, um, all the relevant electoral uh, authorities and indeed the other parties um, with regard to the conduct of the election uh, next year. Um, as Mr. Rusko is probably aware, uh, we will have to bring a conduct order later this year, but the potential also exists for the need for primary legislation to accompany that. Now, I don't want to say too much when we haven't had the opportunity to discuss this directly with the political parties, but self-evidently, we have to look very closely at how an election is conducted safely, uh, but also in a way that maximises the opportunity for everyone to cast their vote. So there's a fairly extensive piece of work going on at the moment. I would hope probably next week uh, to have detailed discussions with the parties in the parliament to gauge their views, and we will take it forward from there. But you're absolutely right to highlight this, Mr. Ruskell, because Clearly, with the COVID crisis, uh, there are impacts, uh, potential impacts, certainly, on the conduct of the forthcoming election. Thank you. Do you have a follow up, Mark? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, it raises a lot of questions, doesn't it? I mean, the question that's in my mind is about turnout. If you've got certain communities that are under lockdown, other communities aren't, how does that affect turnout? So. And obviously, that could be very significant in terms of the result of an election. So, I'm wondering if those kind of issues are being really worked through. Who's working on those from an independent um, analysis? Then, for the political parties and those of us who have got a vested interest, to then consider, you know, what what the complications might be. Well, I can offer assurance on both fronts. When all of these uh, items are being looked at in detail, but clearly the discussions with the political parties may throw up other things that we haven't uh, immediately captured. In terms of independent involvement in um, determining how we, the best way forward, we are, for example, in discussions with the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Management Board. So this is very much uh, a holistic look at um, how we deliver this in the most appropriate way. With regard to your point about uh, particular groups, very much alive to that. So, for example, um, those who've been who've had to shield uh, during the COVID crisis, are they a group, for example, uh, for whom access to postal votes might be particularly important? So, um, uh, as I say, it's difficult to kind of expand on this in great detail um, because I, I want to talk to all of the parties of the parliament and continue the discussions with the, the electoral authorities. So we have a set of proposals, I think, that um, uh, address the issues that we all know we, we may, may well have and also satisfy everyone that, um, and the public, because we have, to, we have to ensure that the public have confidence in the process uh, next year. I think it's inevitable there will be changes to elements of the electoral process, but always done with those two um, ambitions. One is to conduct the election as safely as possible, and two, to ensure that the maximum number of people are able to exercise their vote. 
Thank you. That's fine, Rush, uh, Mark. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for that question. Now, we've got a couple of other questions here. Um, right, first is Maureen, then Jamie, and then we will have one Scott specifically on the process of disqualification. So, Maureen first, please. Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Minister, in your discussions with the uh, electoral registration officers, have they indicated to you that they are under pressure in terms of getting the information for the register this year because of COVID and lockdown? Okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to bring in one of my officials to answer that in detail because they obviously have been having um, that kind of uh, dialogue. Um, uh, Kenny, are you on the line there? Could you perhaps pick that up? Hello, yep. Um, so, in, in, in officials are regularly in contact with the Scottish Assessors Association um, that represents the EROs. Um, so, from attending their meeting, you know that they are under pressure this year, um, both in, from the impact of COVID and the fact that resources are being redeployed into other areas. Um, it is also the first year that they are implementing a newly reformed canvas. Um, and also, because we are working, uh, any changes to do electoral law need to be done uh, in tandem with the UK government and the Welsh government. They are liaising with uh, their equivalent of the SA, the, the, electoral, uh, the Association of Electoral Administrators. And they are reporting the same things, that they are under pressure uh, in terms of resources. And this small change of a delay of two months will allow them to process the returns from the canvas over a slightly longer period and not take some of the pressure off. And what might be the effect of any local lockdowns on the uh, capacity of EROs to publish their electoral register by February uh, 2021? I don't know whether Mr. Pentland wants to answer that. Yep. So um, the, the EROs obviously will have to uh, do what's required of them under electoral law in publishing a register. They'll also have to be um, uh, vigilant as to, to, as to any Scottish government guidance around COVID, and, and, and we'll respect that. They have a number of routes of communicating with electors, especially since a newly reformed candidate process has been implemented this year, which doesn't require um, face-to-face uh, door knocking, uh, sort of following up at houses. So, um, obviously, I'm not pretending that they're not working under very difficult circumstances this year. Um, they're not feeding back that, that um, publishing a canvas that is as accurate and complete as possible under the circumstances won't be possible. Uh, can I continue, convener? Just I've got a couple of short okay. ones. Okay, um, just short. Then, Thank you. Um, so I have a concern about it's all uh, really to be done on computer now, and I have a concern that people who don't have access to a com computer, especially um, you know when there's limited access to libraries and places and community centres where you can perhaps um, go and log on and get help to log on. I mean, I was in my office briefly. Uh, it's not open, but somebody came to my door very distressed about whether he was on the register or not. And fortunately, I could check and reassure him uh, that he was because he had the paperwork. But I do worry about some people um, you know, not being on the register because they haven't got access to a computer. And my final question, sorry, is, um, are we already seeing uh, an uptake on from people returning their their forms or or going online uh, an uptake in postal voting for uh, next year's election? Uh, I'll, I'll pick up on that um, from Ms. Watt. I mean, in terms of of what we anticipate, I'm not I'm not. Um, entirely okay with the numbers that she's referring to in terms of returning their forms. What I can say is that there's been substantial work done on our behalf with the public to gauge um, the appetite for um, postal vote engagement in the election. 
and the indications are that they're uh, not surprisingly in light of uh, the COVID crisis that there is uh, an increased appetite to access postal votes um, and that is one of the issues that we are currently exploring uh, as to how we um, uh, meet that uh, demand. Uh, to go back to your first point, I think the answer lies in the piece of work that we had at the committee a few months ago. Um, the whole process of making sure that we maximise the number of people online has, uh, on the uh, register has various strands. Um, and I would be optimistic that the approach we are taking all round here um, will help ensure that we address the type of issues um, Maureen Watt is highlighting. But if she has um, any more specific concerns, I am happy to engage with her directly on these and then um, write to her on these. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Maureen. Is that, is that fine for you at the moment? That's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Okay. Um, next, we have Jamie Halcrow Johnson, and then we'll have John Scott. Jamie, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the minister and the officials. Um, my question is a, a first question is a little bit along the lines, same things as Maureen. What was asking there? Um, you know, there there are obviously going to be uh, there are going to be potential areas, potential groups that are harder to reach, harder to access. Can you tell me where those are? Is there geographical? Um, is there geographical difficulties? Are there different difficulties in terms of getting voters of a certain age onto the register, uh, people from different social backgrounds. Where are those harder to reach? Uh, who are those harder to reach groups and what's being done to, to reach them? Okay, I want to bring uh, Kenny in, uh, in on that because he has a direct uh, engagement with the EROs. Kenny. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the, the Electoral Commission published a uh, report on the completeness and accuracy of the uh, register uh, uh, annually. Um, and what they tend to find is that uh, there are gaps in, in younger people, uh, particularly students, also people in, in, in private rented accommodation who may move around more frequently. And the piece of uh, legislation that the committee saw a couple of months ago about the reforms canvas is really aimed to, to, to address or partly to address that issue. Um, that's because uh, if, if you lived in, a, in the same property for 20 years, you don't need as intensive a, a, a follow-up process from your registration officer because as long as the uh, data matches and, you, and it shows that you're, you're living at the same property, um, it's not as essential that they chase you up. However, if you're a student or, or a younger person, you move around more frequently, um, that's where EROs need the discretion to tailor more of their uh, resources uh, and efforts to, to get those people on register. Um, the, there probably are other groups um, uh, that, you know, uh, where it isn't as complete as others, uh, but, but students and young people and private People, private rented accommodation are the ones that stand out, I think. Can I ask for but again, just a... But again, if Mr. Halker Johnson has any specific concerns, and I suspect he's um, given the area he represents, he's thinking particularly of remote rural areas. Again, if he wants to write to me about that, I'll come back with as much detail for him as possible. Well, just, just on that one area that might be of interest to hear about is care homes, obviously, um, given the you know additional restrictions that are on there and the additional work. So that's maybe one that um, I'll, I'll send some information to you, Minister. Thank you for that. Um, two, two, two last final kind of very simple questions, I suppose. How confident are you that the canvas will be as robust and as accurate as it can be, uh, and certainly compared with previous years? Um, and are all the, uh, the canvas process and the ROs on target um, to achieve what they need to achieve by the deadlines that have been set? Okay, uh, uh, two things. Um, as robust as it can be, yes, I think, given the challenges we face. But I think we're also aware that there is still the um, rolling register element to this. So there is an ongoing process of updating. Um, you know, we can't pretend that COVID will not have an impact of some kind, potentially. 
but I think it's as robust as it can be. And just to pick up on your point about the deadlines, this is an extension. If an individual ERO has completed or feels they've completed the register ahead of that, then there is nothing to stop them publishing prior to the extended deadline. And I know that, that uh, EROs have been encouraged to engage proactively um, with the political parties in their locality uh, to make people as aware as they can be of the progress that's being made. So I am optimistic that it will be as robust as it's possible for it to be in the present circumstances. Yeah. I think that's fine for now. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie Halker Johnson. Um, okay, we're now moving on to um, John Scott, who is specifically speaking on disqualification. Then we're going to have Mark Ruskell again and Neil Finlay, please. So, John Scott, thank you. Well, thank you, Convener. Um, can you just provide us, um, Mr. Day, with more detail on the process for making uh, changes to the order? I think you mentioned uh, a significant number of changes, but could you just give us a little bit more information on, on how you go about that? You've added 61, you've removed 19, and there are 537 on the list. Um, just give us more detail, please. Uh, I, I, have an expert. I, I have an expert on that in the room. Uh, Al Gibson should be there to assist us, give you the absolute detail you're looking for. Good. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, I think the process is um, best explained by, um, as the Minister had said, the select criteria for considering who should and who should not be disqualified um, from the, the Scottish Parliament. Um, that has been, those criteria have been in place since devolution and um, the list of uh, bodies contained in the order reflects uh, those those offices which are deemed to fall within those criteria, for example, political impartiality, uh, offices um, where remuneration is over ten thousand pounds. These are all um, these are all um, criteria that um, uh, that um, are applied across the board. Um, as I say, since 1999, and the actual process uh, for reviewing these bodies and the rationale for the changes are um, one, just the changing public body landscape across the UK. But the way we um, identify that um, is, um, as the minister said, with a, con a troll conducted across uh, Scottish government um, policy leads, sponsor teams um, to refine the list of bodies. So, for example, bodies which are, are no longer in existence uh, would obviously be removed, and there are always new bodies coming on stream. And it's been a few years since the making of the last order, so that constitutes quite a lot of change. Um, again, um, as the Minister said, we've worked with colleagues in the um, uh, Office of the Secretary of State for Scotland, who in turn, uh, on our behalf, help us coordinate returns from all UK government departments. Um, and again, that involves a, a very wide range of people, um, and one might argue with the wide range of um, potentially differing views on uh, uh, how they interpret the criteria. But um, ultimately, it's the relevant um, government official um, across the UK who is asked to uh, consider the terms of the order as from uh, the last order and whether any changes are required, and then the process is just simply one of um, uh, coordination of that across um, the piece, uh, as the minister explained, and then um, the UK government entries are combined with any changes that we've received um, within the Scottish government exercise, um, and then uh, these are approved uh, for the order. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, John. Um, okay, can we go to Mark Ruskell on absent voting issues, please? Yeah, uh, thanks, convener. I just had a, a couple of um, couple of follow-ups. I was looking at the uh, absent voting, or I guess you could say proxy voting, um, statutory instrument that, that's before the committee. I'm just trying to work out how this would would work in practice. So. 
say I had a persistent cough or high temperature, I'm six days out from the election, I'm shielding effectively or self-isolating, I could then nominate somebody to vote for me. But what if I was an elderly person who wasn't online? Uh, how would I go about this? Um, you know, what would be the issues in terms of filling out forms? If again, I'm shielding and I, and I shouldn't really be in contact with other people. I'm just trying to get my head around the practicalities of, of this order and how how that will actually work in, in practice in that situation. Yeah, and, and anticipating that the committee would be looking for that kind of detail, uh, hence the officials that I've got with me. So I'll bring in uh, Kenny Pentland to answer that uh, question specifically, Mr. Oscar. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the emergency proxy is, as I'm sure you're aware, it is already available uh, to people on medical grounds. So, so for example, if, if an older person who wasn't necessarily online um, had, had a medical emergency um, but still wanted to vote, um, they would be following the same kind of process. It would be contacting the ERO um, and, and, and making an application. I think it's an interesting point you make about um, uh, uh, you know, physical distancing in that situation. I think that's something ERO will again have to be aware of and, and adjust to. Um, perhaps uh, go back to the Scottish Assessors Association to get a more detailed answer for you. But um, I guess with the legislation, the key point is that, that this group of people who are self-isolating at short notice who had no recourse to vote, but at, at the very least now they have the same um, option in front of them as someone who, is, who has had a medical emergency uh, six days before an election. Yeah, um, I suppose it's a particular type of medical condition though, isn't it? Which means that you can't get in contact with other people directly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've said, said that there are issues to work through there. Um, can I just ask another question? And it, Minister, you mentioned that there might be a need for primary legislation. I, I'm interested in how much legislation will be needed ahead of the next Holyrood election to put in all the reforms that we've agreed previously through this committee uh, and the ones that are COVID related and whether there are any issues in terms of the length of this session that's left? No, I don't believe so. Um, we, in the context of possible primary legislation, we're currently working through the options. I, I think it would be reasonable to assume that there might be some expedited element uh, to that, but I would want to have Parliament have sufficient time to work through um, any proposals that were there. I, I don't want to, to, to appear evasive in any way, Mr Rusko, um, but we are at that stage of having dialogue across the Parliament or commencing detailed dialogue. So it's difficult to give you specifics, but by way of, of, of guidance, I would anticipate um, that if we were to require primary legislation, it would be, uh, it would have completed its parliamentary process by around the end of this year. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, thank you. Sorry. If you're helpful, given the role of the committee, um, I'd be quite happy to write to the committee and keep it updated as um, matters progress over possible legislation. Okay, that seems perfectly reasonable. Thank you very much for that, uh, Minister. Thanks, Mark, for your questions there. Um, can we now move on to Neil Finlay, please? Thanks, Convener. Um, in some of our briefing papers for the uh, committee, um, I just want to check one thing that it says. Uh, it says that um, on disqualification, that um, it appears to say that members can be disqualified from being a member of parliament or um, being a member of parliament, but only for particular constituencies or regions. Of, is that correct? Right. I'll bring in Mr. Gibson. He he can answer that for us. Um, yes, Mr. Findlay, that that is correct. That that's not applied to all the uh, listed office holders. That is uh, uh, relevant to those who appear in a separate part of the schedule, um, and is referenced to those um, of uh, uh, who hold posts of Lord Lieutenants, uh, etc. Across. So these people are 
uh, distinct in terms of their area in that regard, but all the other office holders, that applies across the board. So, uh, someone who's say a Lord Lieutenant of you know, West Lothian would not be able to stand in a West Lothian constituency. Is that how it works? That that's correct. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Um, are NHS boards included in the list? I've had a quick look at the list. And I couldn't see it. Um, they would be included so, on some occasions. Entries are generic in nature, as opposed to specifying. Uh, particular boards, you know, for example, Fife Health Board. Uh, so we do have entries which uh, are generic and uh, may indeed refer to the statutory reference. So we can um, uh, certainly confirm um, uh, which um, reference that would be. But that is a general that is a general um, uh, suite of bodies that would naturally be included in the order. And finally, um, if someone was a member of say, an NHS board or a, or the Coal Authority or Creative Scotland uh, or any of the others on the list, and they uh, stood down, is there a period of cooling off or uh, between that and them then saying, "I am now going to be a candidate," or is it, you know, the day before they can say, "Right, that's me." I'm all. Uh, I'm standing down from this board, and the following day they can then be a candidate. The um, the issues around the timing um, when someone is um, submitting their consent to nomination, uh, the expectation as um, and as uh, set out in the electoral commission guidance is that an individual will con confirm at the point of uh, submission. That uh, they do not um, hold a they are not disqualified from membership of the parliament. So um, the general understanding is that separation is is uh, is is achieved by that point. So somebody would be a candidate; they would be stepping aside from their public role. Uh, and again, terms and condition of a appointment in many public offices, as members may know, um, were. Uh, do include reference to political impartiality, uh, and we've seen in practice um, these issues are taken up by the individuals themselves, with chairs or uh, chief execs um, on a on a case by case basis. And to my knowledge, um, the uh, impact of that is that separation occurs before the consent to nomination uh, is submitted. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, thanks, Neil, and thanks, Minister. Can we move uh, back to John Scott again, please? Thank you, John. Um, just further to Mark Ruskell's question, uh, what uh, assessment has the uh, Minister done on the likely effect on turnout? I, I would suspect that that's likely to disproportionately affect the elderly. Um, and particularly the shielded as well, and the two almost go hand in hand. And um, what, what what impact assessment have you done on that? If COVID is still as prevalent as it is today, on the effect on the turnout of the elderly. Um, we're we've done um, some significant market research, for example, on people's attitudes. Um, to voting. Um, and I think it's a reasonable uh, point to raise because will any particular group um, be less inclined to go out and vote in the traditional manner if they are fearful yeah. or they have been shielding? It's a perfectly uh, good point to make, Mr. Scott. That's therefore why one of the possibilities would be to encourage postal vote uptake amongst the shielding group, for example, or um, anyone who might feel particularly vulnerable uh, in these circumstances. Um, so this is all being looked at, and, I, and as I say, I, I, I hesitate to, 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 um, to take this line and, and suggest in some way I'm, I'm being evasive, but we are very much at that point of having identified all of the aspects of this and now beginning detailed discussion about how we would best address that. And that's a matter for the whole of the parliament and all of the political parties to feed in 
to that process along with the various electoral authorities. So there have been initial discussions with the parties to make them aware of um, the work that's being done. And starting next week, uh, that dialogue will ramp up. Uh, and clearly, members, and as I said earlier, this committee clearly has a locus in this, and I'll be more than happy to, keep, to write to the committee and keep it updated. Thank you. I, I would just ask, you, you do have time to do that um, between now and the election, given the, was it the Gould Committee suggesting that things, uh, these instruments at least have six months but to settle, so to speak? So, so, Mr. Scott's referring, obviously, to the, um, the conduct order and the six months to settle in. Um, primary legislation might be a slightly different matter, but the aim would be to have that done in very good time to allow for everyone to understand exa exactly um, what the look of the election might be. But I would have to stress that in the context of primary legislation, we would in some instances simply be putting contingencies in place that might not be needed, depending on mm -hmm. the circumstances. So it's about preparing for the, the possibilities. Um, you know, for, for example, might it be advisable, uh, might it be necessary to conduct the election over two days? It might not. It might. Um, Self-evidently, a socially distanced count would be a different beast to those that we as politicians are traditionally used to. Now, all of these things are being looked at along with voter accessibility and trying to ensure that everyone has um, the appropriate opportunity to cast the vote. You're right, it's, it is quite extensive. and There's a lot to think about. Uh, that process is well underway. And my anticipation is that with a fair wind, we can um, have any necessary legislation through the Parliament by the end of the year. The one caveat I would place to that is it might be necessary to have an additional um, emergency amendment to the conduct order. I think members would appreciate that circumstances can change, but the, the, the will, the intention here is to give Parliament appropriate opportunity to consider this, but also to get in place sufficiently early to ensure that everyone knows what um, the election will look like. I, I suppose, and for the public record, what you haven't said, but m much of this could be done also by a statutory instrument, or some of it at any rate, if there needs to be changes made, rather than primary legislation. And yes, that is all I'll, I'll, I'll to bring Al Gibson in to, to, to add to this, but um, my understanding is that, that there are certain aspects of change that would require primary legislation. But you're right, Mr. Scott, we could frame this in a way that we could do any um, more immediate changes that may be required by statutory instrument, albeit under a process that allows this committee or any relevant committee to scrutinise that in detail. But let me bring in uh, Al Gibson on that. Thank you. I, I, I um, think that is, I mean, as, as the minister says, I mean, it's very dependent on the nature of the changes and whatever uh, policy is, is agreed um, between political parties and others. So dependent on the moves that are required will define whether um, uh, measures are required to be taken forward through primary or secondary legislation, but um, either way, each would find its place. Quite. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John, and thank you to the uh, minister and his team. Uh, can we have uh, another question from? I can see Gil Parsons waving his hand, but. Um, Hold on a second. You have been waving it before, so I think we should have Gil at first and then Maureen next, please. Thank you. Gil Patterson. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I thought you were signing you off without coming to me there. You gave me a fright. Yeah. Um, when, when, when we first discussed this, uh, these changes that would allow uh, EROs to contact people by telephone, etc., uh, that was well before COVID, so uh, I take it that they are working from home, 
Uh, and obviously the budget that was set at that time envisaged that there would be the regular amount of face-to-face. -face. But because of the changes to this, I, I take it, it there's obviously a time uh, constraint put on that causes pressure. But is there a budget pressure that, that's also there that needs uh, looked at because of obviously there'll be more uh, up, yeah, coming directly through telephone contact, etc. I'm not aware, um, Mr. Patterson, of, of any approach as yet um, along those lines. Um, but clearly, um, if there were an evidence um, issue, then that's something the government would um, look at if that were to be the case. Um, I'm not directly aware of anything along those lines at the moment. Uh, and at this stage, uh, the differential between the practice in the past and the new practice, is that showing up uh, how fast that method is compared to the, what we used to do? Okay, I'll bring um, uh, Kenny Pentland in there because I think he, if, if we have uh, any evidence of that, he'll, he'll be uh, alive to that, uh, Kenny. Um, <clears throat> yeah, th this year's canvas began uh, in sort of for most EROs in the first of July, so it is is quite early on. I also get the impression from EROs that that while this is the first year of a newly reformed canvas. They're taking quite a cautious approach, and that means that um, Route 2 of the reformed canvas, which is more similar to what has happened in previous years, um, is more likely to be the route that they're choosing. They're not, they're not going to um, send lots and lots of potential electors down Route 1. Um, so we don't have evidence yet and and we think that they'll take quite a cautious approach to the to the new um uh communication options at their disposal um but i'm sure after this year's canvas we'll we'll have something to evaluate okay that's yes, fine thank you. i'm happy for that most of the other thank questions you. have come no problem thank you very much for that Gil Parsons. thanks minister and team um Okay, so we next uh, we've got four more questions here. Uh, Maureen Watt, please. Thank you. Um, so my questions were in relation to things that have just come up as we've uh, been having uh, this meeting. Uh, one was on uh, Lord Lieutenants. It's not all Lord Lieutenants, is it? Or am, am I getting this wrong? And secondly, on um, people who are in the shielding category. Clearly, um, we have a, a database of, of all those people. Is there a way, um, it's just to relieve the stress of people who are already stressed about being in that category. Is there a way that we could get all party agreement, maybe, that these people automatically be sent a postal vote? Voting form, they don't have to fill it in, but at least um, you know, that would be one less thing they have to worry about. Um, I think you've been reading my mind, Ms. Watt, <laughs> on that second point. That That is um, something along those lines is one of the, the things we're, we're going to explore. I think it's um, if we could um, access uh, that data and there was agreement, then it's an option. I'm not going to say we're definitely going to do it, but it's a sensible option to at least um, explore. Um, and that perhaps illustrates the, the depth we're going into on this. What we're trying to, to, to determine is how do we best afford everyone the op opportunity to vote if circumstances are different to what we would all consider the, the usual. Um, and, I, and as I said, I've, I've said repeatedly, I'll be more than happy to write to the committee and keep it updated on that. With regard to the oral tenancy question, I should bring uh, Al Gibson back in on that. Yes, um, that, that, that aspect of the order is, is quite can be um, confusing. Uh, it is it isn't it isn't the case that all Lord Lieutenants are 
uh, dealt with in the same way and as the other entries in the order. Uh, for that reason, they would be. Uh, but it is just to recognise the local nature of those um, disqualifications. So, as I uh, mentioned to Mr. Findlay earlier, um, the office holder concerned would have a disqualification, but restricted to the area in which they um, operate, if that's a correct term, I'm not sure, um, or officiate. Um, but um, again, um, if there's, um, if it would be helpful, I'm perfectly happy to uh, just clarify that in, in, in writing, if that, if the if um if not, if that would be helpful please okay. Will do. thank you oh, thank you both uh, and uh, thanks very much for that question and answer uh, Jamie Halker Johnson please Jamie there you go uh, yes yeah, sorry I was just waiting for the um, oh. microphone to unmute um sorry just a very quick um practical question um and it kind of covers a little bit of what's uh, was what's been asked already. But in the um, we've seen a number of outbreaks of COVID um, in um, in workplaces and also cases so far within schools, although um, not necessarily linked to those schools directly. If there was an outbreak in a workplace or in a school or anywhere else um, a number of days before an election. Um, i.e. before it's possible, uh, sorry, after it's possible for um, individuals to get um, postal voting. And the requirement, therefore, was that they either, either voted in person, which they would obviously not, many would not be able to do if they were being told to, to quarantine, um, or they get a proxy vote. Will that be possible? And will, you know, will the local edge, um, electoral bodies be able to turn that around? And what additional support might they need to do that? Okay, um, I'll bring uh, Kenny Pentland in on this because this is something that we're working through at the moment. Um, I think, in, in general, uh, the, the options available to everyone and, and which might be more relevant uh, because of COVID it, it, it are the postal votes, the standard proxies, which we haven't been talking about today, which you can apply for. You know, they're not emergency proxies. You can apply it in a good amount of time, and then and then the emergency proxies. Um, and obviously, the, the the minister mentioned the public attitudes towards alternative voting survey, which which by the way has now been published on the electoral commission website, so you can get a sense of from the voters perspective. But in terms of EROs and their capacity, and this is something that we we are working together to kind to kind of gauge because 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 it may be it may be that, that that it is that some forms of voting see an uptake because of the circumstances. So if that forms part of the discussions we have with with the EROs and with the Electoral Management Board and with the Commission. So it's it's an ongoing sort of extensive engagement uh, that we're having in the run up to the election. Okay, because. Just to add to that, I mean, this this is an ongoing process. So just as we will hear from the parties of the parliament, their thoughts, so we will continue to listen to the EROs who may come up with something else. And we, we will have to be responsive to this. Um, I can't sit here today and say this is going to be perfect. In the circumstances we're operating in, uh, that would be um, not particularly wise to suggest. But the intention here is to do the absolute maximum we can to ensure the election is conducted safely and um, we can maximise the number of people able to cast their vote. No, I, I mean, I absolutely appreciate that. I appreciate it's part of an ongoing process, but there's a the, the concern here that could be that, firstly, a large group of people may well be disenfranchised if they can't, um, you know, if they can't because of restrictions to their movement be able to vote in person and they're not able to get that proxy. And also, um, the integrity of that polling station locally near a, near a, an outbreak. If there are concerns that people who are meant to be quarantined are accessing that polling station, that may discourage other people. So, I, you know, I think it's important that those are considered um, uh, when you're looking at this issue. 
I, I, and I, I'll give you the undertaking that they will be, because this is really this has been quite an important discussion. Because well, although we were looking at two particular instruments, we've strayed into the wider context, and it just yeah. it illustrates the points that members have made, just how complex an issue this is. So it's been useful to hear your thoughts on that. We'll take those away, and we'll feed those into the considerations that we're going to have over the next few weeks. I appreciate that. I appreciate we may have um, wandered off topic, but I think it's been helpful. Thank you. No, no, it's been useful. Okay, thank you very much, Jamie Halker Johnson, um, the Minister. Um, next person with a question, uh, Neil Finlay on market research, please, Neil. Yeah, yeah it's basically just uh, the Minister referred to market research. I'm just wondering if we could share that with the committee. Um, well, as, as was just indicated, it's just been published on the um, Electoral Commission website this morning, so it is um, readily accessible. It's interesting. Um, Obviously, it's a snapshot in time. It may well be that we um, repeat that market research, but we will also get, I think, a direction of travel from the 11 council by-elections that are scheduled for later this year. So, for example, I think someone touched earlier on the subject of uptake on postal voting or proxy voting. Now, I recognise the scale and perhaps the interest in a council by-election is somewhat lower than a national election. Nevertheless, We'll begin to see perhaps percentage variations in the number of people who pursue a postal vote or a proxy vote, and that will help inform our planning as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. And Minister, um, would it be possible for your um, team to send us that link for the research? Absolutely. Um, Kenny's obviously on the line. If I can ask him to. Email that to the clerks in the next uh, little while. The link, and um, again, if the committee has any questions about it, please feel free to engage with us directly. Thanks very much, for, and thanks, uh, thanks, Kenny. Thank you. Um, okay, um, right. We've got three more people with questions here, so try and uh, get them direct to the point. If it's okay, please. Um, Mark uh, Ruskell, then Gil Parson, then John Scott. So, Mark Ruskell, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, you acknowledge there, Minister, that it's clearly not going to be perfect next year. One option would be to shift the date of the election, push it back, say, to autumn 21. Is that something that is still under consideration or not? I, I've been clear um, throughout the discussions that have taken place uh, in the Parliament. I mean, this was here a few months ago in the floor of the chamber. It is still the intention of the government um, to hold the election as it's scheduled. So we are not actively looking at pushing back the election. Now, clearly, if we were in a circumstance that was uh, considerably different to the one we're in at the moment, then that's something that the Parliament might have to consider in conjunction with the presiding officer. Um, but right now, there is no consideration being given uh, to push the election back. All of our efforts are being directed to, to ensuring that the election goes ahead as planned, as safely as possible, taking account of the need to maximise the opportunity for voters uh, to cast their vote and feel comfortable doing that. OK, Mark, do you want something else on it? OK, thank you very much for that, and thanks, Minister. Uh, Gil Patterson, please. The same question. It's like uh, Mark and I are tuned in on this one. Uh, yeah. Is the government prepared to, in the event of something like March, uh, if there was a general lockdown, uh, is there contingency plans for the nuclear option, option, or is it practical to have a, a all a postal ballot uh, for an election? Are we equipped to do that? Um, the, the, the answer to that, Mr. Patterson, is it would be extremely challenging, capacity-wise, to have an all-postal ballot. Uh, even if every, you know, um, that was a popular um, option, uh, you will always have a percentage. And if you look at the market research, that backs this up. 
a, a, a sizable percentage of the electorate who don't want to vote by post. They either want to vote in person because that's the traditional way, or they don't, for whatever reason, trust the postal vote system. Um, so it would be extremely difficult and in practical terms, uh, pretty much impossible resource wise. So uh, as you can imagine, to process that volume of postal votes would take an enormous amount of time and effort. Um, so I don't think that's a practical option. Um, but in, in the context of, uh, I think you used the phrase, the nuclear option, um, all things have got to be considered. This is about contingency planning for, for all possibilities. But I don't want to set any hairs running. And I, and I have expected Mr Finlay to ask the question about whether there was any thinking um, about postponing the election, because he asked that in the chamber a little while ago, ad admitting an interest himself. Um, it's not something that we are actively looking at, but it, but it, it, it has to be a, a remote possibility. And again, this will come down to the discussions that, that take place uh, and a view has come to, because this is a matter for the parliament, it's not just for the government, this is a matter for the parliament uh, and the, for the involvement with, from the presiding officer. Um, I mean, I would be optimistic that with the work that's going on and with goodwill all around, we can find a way to conduct the election safely and appropriately uh, to the date we're looking at with the caveat of COVID-19. If things were to change markedly, that would obviously have an impact on it. But all of the work that's going on is designed to deliver the election to the timelines that we're looking at. I appreciate that. Thanks very much, Minister. Right, thank you, Gail Patterson. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, uh, one of them which is from Neil Finlay, so you might get your wish, uh, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> so could we have a first question, please, from John Scott and then from Neil Finlay. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks again, convener. Um, uh, my question is more granular, I suppose, but I'm thinking well, what scenario planning have you done if, say, a particular school, which might be a polling station, had to be closed the day before the election? And that might have a very marked effect on the people who would normally go to that school inclination to go there to vote, might very much reduce that. And as we all know, there are different uh, polling stations in each of our constituencies where um, you know, the, the turnout at that polling station is significant relative to the overall outcome of the election. So what scenario planning have you done with regard to that type of incident happening May in May at the end of the winter period, you know, when that's going to be maximising amounts of winter period germs about, shall we say. Yeah, I mean, that really is granular, but you're right to raise that, Mr Scott, because these are the kind of nitty gritty issues that could uh, come into play. Um, I'm not specifically recalling us looking at that particular example. Um, but our colleagues, the EROs, are obviously doing their own scenario planning. Um, one of the things that I've asked for is to look at the, for example, the, the layout of some polling stations. And this is we are very often, if it's in a school, you walk through a door into the classroom and you walk out the same door. So, you know, can we have one way systems to help in, uh, improve the social distancing? In the context of whether you had to close a polling station at short notice and, and move elsewhere, uh, I think it's a very good point to make. One I'll certainly take away and um, engage with the electoral management board on, and again, happy to write back to the committee on it, because that, that is it's a reasonable question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we're going to have to draw this to a close. We've got a couple of things to go, but Neil Finlay, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks. I'm glad the Minister mentioned the uh, election. I do recall that exchange in the Chamber at the start and the uh, somewhat uncharitable answer from the Minister at the time. Uh, um, but here we are. Here we are um, uh, uh, discussing this again, and I think it's a very, um, a very apt discussion to be having because 
Um, clearly, I think from what the Minister is saying, and he's not giving too much away, but there must be plan B under the table. Um, because surely we don't want to get to December or January and you know who knows what happens and then you're starting to plan at that point. So I think the Minister is maybe being a bit cagey in what he's saying in terms of scenario planning. But um, if you're not scenario planning, then Minister, you, you should be. You certainly should be, because no one knows how this is going to go. Um, the one plea I would have is that for uh, that if there is um, any uh, concerns, that those are aired as soon as possible to be fair to our constituents, um, cases that we may be dealing with, organisations that we may, we may have been dealing with for the last X amount of years or how many times we're in Parliament, and also for people's futures and their families' futures. So um, I, I really would make a plea that um, if there are any discussions about um, potential changes, that they are aired as soon as possible with members. Mr. Finlay, that is absolutely the intention. I have been as open as I possibly can be. I am not in any way holding back in what I am saying to the committee. Any um, reluctance you, you are interpreting from what I have said to you it, it purely relates to the fact that we have to discuss this as a parliament. Um, there may be parties who have a completely different view on matters. Um, what I'm looking to do is to develop a consensus in the first instance around the best way forward, to get into this in the level of detail that Mr Scott has alluded to and others about how we conduct the election. But I reiterate, right now, all of our work is being done with a view to the election taking place in May next year in a safe and appropriate way. Um, do you contingency plan for, for other eventualities? Of course, of course, you have to consider that. But as the things stand, two things at play. One, where are we now? What are the sensible measures that we ought to put in place? Um, options that we may not require to use. But also, I go back to something that, that was also discussed in that session in the Parliament, Mr. Finlay, about, and it's kind of allude, it ties in with what you're saying about giving people the maximum notice about what's going to happen. So, if there have to be changes made to the nature of the election, people are aware of that from an early uh, stage. If they feel they're going to want to access or need to access a postal vote, then the earlier the better um, for everyone. Um, so. I would say that in three weeks' time, um, uh, I would be in a position to write back to the committee and better update it on the views of the Parliament on this. Now, Mr. Finlay can obviously feed in uh, to this through his own party, and if the committee has any particular views, I'm more than happy uh, to hear those, uh, because we need to build a consensus around this so that the Parliament is satisfied that any measures that are taken forward um, reflect the best interest of the voters. And are appropriate. Okay, is that all right, uh, Neil? Yep. Yep. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we've had a, a good uh, run through and a good kick at the ball there. I uh, was. I'd like to thank the minister and the officials um, for the evidence that they've given. Um, now, following uh, following my brief here. Um, I'm looking to see if we can invite the minister to move motion S five M double two four one eight in your name that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee recommends that the Scottish Parliament's qualification order twenty twenty draft be approved. Minister, would you like to move the motion and is there anything further you want to say? Uh, move can be there are nothing further to add. Okay, thank you very much. Um anyone else want just to put anything else in there at the moment, because um, I don't think there is no. Um, because um, I'll then put the question uh, that motion S five M double two four one eight be agreed. Are we all agreed? And I see no. Oh, 
That's a yes there. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> and we all agree. As anyone as a, anyone disagrees, because we don't have any sound on at the moment, it might be easier that way. And I don't see anything. So, um, given that uh, that uh, is agreed, I can confirm that members are content to sign off the committee's report on the order, and in which case we'll move on to agenda item five. And agenda item five is um, I'd like to invite the Minister to move motion um, S5M22491 in his name that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee recommends that representation of the People Electoral Register's publication date Coronavirus Scotland Regulations 2020 draft be approved. Minister, would you like to move the motion and speak to it if you have anything to say, please? Uh, move can be around in the interest of brevity. No, I won't add anything further. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> um, any members have anything further to contribute on this? I don't see anything at the moment. Okay, um, right, thank you. So the question is that motion S5M22491 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And I'll actually just um, to add, does anyone object? Because it's easier when the sound is not there. Okay, that seems to be fine. Um, right, well, thank you. So, uh, I can confirm that ministers, uh, mem beg your pardon, members are con uh, content for me to sign off the committee's report on these regulations. And I thank the minister for his attendance and allow him and his officials to leave. Uh, and we'll move on to be in, in private. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. For being right. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody to the 13th meeting of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appoints Committee. Uh, we're now going to move to agenda item six for the committee to consider two negative SSIs. Uh, firstly, the, lo the Scottish Local Government Elections Amendment Order 2020 and the representation of the people absent voting at Local Government Elections Amendment Coronavirus Scotland Regulations 2020. And I would like to highlight that when the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the latter instrument at its meeting on 25th of August, it did not raise any points in relation to the regulations. Um, so can I ask uh, members of the committee, if they have any points to raise in relation to these two instruments, please indicate uh, to me now if you have any points you want to make. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing any, any points from members at this point. So um, do we then agree that we do not want to make any recommendation as a committee in relation to the two instruments? Speak now if you, do, if you, you agree with that. You don't agree with that. You agree with that. Great. Okay, thanks. So uh, we have agreement from the committee on that point. And that now uh, closes the public part of the meeting and at this point we're now going to move into private session. Thank you.